Welcome to THA Talks, for free thought and open minds. Hello, I'm Paul Obertelli and you're listening to edition 98 of THA Talks, the alternative podcast show from the UK, bringing you weekly shows and all the best interviews we can get our sticky mitts on. If you'd like to check out our full archive, just go to www.thatalks.com to listen to or to download all our free content. Our talks include news, conspiracy, spirituality, the occult, science, history, art, philosophy, religion and much more. For anyone who'd like to contact us and give us some feedback, maybe recommend a guest for the show, you can email us at info at thatalks.com or you can go to our website and click on the contact tab there. And don't forget you can subscribe to the show via our RSS feed and you can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher and many other podcast directories out there. Well, thank you for tuning in again, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be back here on THA Talks as always. And I'd just like to say thank you to all those over the past few weeks who have been sending us emails and messages be it through youtube our our website or emailing us we have been very very busy which is um, i've mentioned before on previous shows that the the shows over the past few weeks have been a bit more sparse than we would have liked and it's because you know uh, david myself uh, and and also shana we have been really really busy with our with our other other responsibilities and day jobs and whatnot and sometimes it just means we're just a bit delayed in getting back to to people so if if we if if we haven't got back to your emails yet and we do apologize and if we miss anyone again it's not for the not for the sake of not appreciating the 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 feedback from you guys so i'd like to say thank you to all those that have messaged us over the message messaged us over the year and um, we do appreciate it Um, and we're only two weeks now away from yule uh, winter solstice christmas these are subjects we are going to be talking about in today's uh call it a yule special i guess i mean yule to me is is i I do quite enjoy it nowadays i mean i do i happen to have quite a lot of respect for the sun and that's kind of how i see it philosophically um you know i'm i'm a pagan so that's kind of my my perspective on it perspective on it all and i do enjoy it i think I, i don't like the sort of capitalist gone capitalism gone crazy part of it with the endless queuing and the, I mean, a lot of people get very depressed because they haven't got the money to to really, so in commas, enjoy it. But I think the thing is, it's important people just take it for what it is and enjoy it in the way that you can. You know, don't don't let those pressures burden you and stuff. Because at the end of the day, that's not what it's all about anyway. Any any season through the year, it's about your relationship with the natural seasons of the planet and how you feel at that time and what it means to you and how you express yourself with it with it all. So. Yeah, I think um, my advice is try to enjoy it because it's 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 another cycle and it's the start of another cycle and that's that's basically life, isn't it? So yeah, that's how I see it. So today we'll be speaking with Tom Rosso about the ancient festival Yule. Tom returns to the show after previously talking to us in edition 70 about Anglo-Saxon paganism and heathenry. He has studied medieval history at UCL and is the presenter and director of the documentary From Runes to Ruins, and before that a film called Boobs and Revolution. He has directed music videos and his own YouTube channel has amassed over one million views. Hi Tom, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back, Paul. Well, I've I've been really looking forward to having you back on the show since since um, edition seventy when you when you're on last because you've obviously got heaps of knowledge on the Anglo-Saxon and the the Norse um, heathenry paganism subject and with you all coming up, we thought it was a perfect time. Um, so, um, how how have you been enjoying it so far? Uh, yes, I'm I'm in Sweden at the moment and it's all very. Uh festive everything is quite dark uh, at this time of year but ev- there's lights up everywhere and uh, last night i attended the uh, santa lucia um the uh, uh, service at the church at the cathedral in Uppsala, and that's really very nice uh, uh, i've heard some people say it might have pagan origins as well but uh, they have 
uh, a girl, the, the prettiest girl is meant to be selected to be the Lucia and they put nine candles on a wreath on her head and she uh, sort of on a procession of um, the girls go wearing dressed in white robes through the church and then they sing carols. It's very nice and festive. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you notice a big difference between how they celebrate it in Sweden to the UK? Well, there's that Santa Lucia thing, is, which is on the which is on the 13th um, or the night of the 12th. And um, that, we don't have that in England because she's not particularly important saint to the English. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's other things as well. Like, um, the They call it Yule here still, which we, I guess we still we use the term Yule as well, from which comes from Anglo-Saxon Yale, um, whereas... Uh, they've kept their old pagan name for it. And um, also, they they kind of been, uh, in recent years, quite influenced by uh, American uh, sort of customs, as we have. For example, you know, the, the figure of Father Christmas in England became merged with the figure of Santa Claus, who is more recent, uh, and they're kind of synonymous now in England. But in uh, in the 19th century, that sort of Santa Claus, Father Christmas tradition hadn't been really in uh, Sweden, but what they did is they emulated it with um, their older tradition of a goat. They have a Yule Bok, uh, which is now is reduced. The only aspect of the Yule Bok they have is they make a straw goat, uh, a goat out of straw, which is a festive thing. But in the 19th century, they developed a kind of a thing with the people dressing as the goat and the goat would go from giving presents to children, taking on the role of Father Christmas or Santa Claus. So you can see that was an influence. Prior to that, it's sort of mysterious of what exactly the function of the Yule Bok was. It kind of, of course, there are many people who uh, speculate a pagan origin, perhaps because of uh, Thor was associated with goats. That that could be um, something to do with him, but we never know for sure. So, I mean, thinking of uh, Santa Claus, Father Christmas. Um, I mean, I'm kind of coming from the perspective. There's there's probably a lot of listeners. Some that some of them that are very familiar with all this. Some of them are interested to, to hear what it's all about. What deity, I mean, I suppose in within Saxon or Norse and pantheons, would would you associate Santa Claus or Father Christmas to? Would, would it be Odin? Well, um, I think that Santa Claus and Father Christmas are a bit different because, mm. um, I mean, the like in the Dutch have uh, Santa Claus and, uh, and the sort of Germanic, some Germanic countries and some uh, other countries have... Santa Claus, but uh, in France and England, we called him uh, in Père Noël or, or Father Christmas, and they would kind of become the same figure in recent centuries. I think the first uh, mention of Father Christmas is in uh, the, the 14, 14th century, or um, I can just check. Uh, yeah, no, it's actually in the um, 1400s. Um, so it's... Uh, he, it's possible that this comes from something much earlier. I mean, that's contemporary with uh, things like the, the, in England you have the uh, the, uh, the Sagawain and the Green Knight, which is a, an, an Arthurian tale, uh, a Christmas um, Christian uh, morality tale. Uh, and uh, there's the green, the, the mysterious sort of quite pagan seeming Green Knight who plays a very Christian role in enforcing Christian morality in that tale. Uh, but uh, obviously, if if we're going to speculate on what, what exactly the pagan origins of that are, because there are no ways of joining it up directly, but we know for sure that Yule was um, associated with Odin, because there's uh, in Heimskringla, uh, in the saga of uh, King Hark and the Good, uh, he um, at the at the Yule feast they make the first toast to Odin, and um, there's also in Gilfaginning in the Eddas. It says that one of the names of Odin is Yule Father. So I mean, there's a there's an argument there for for, for perhaps uh, an Odinic role or uh, similarity at least. Um, and even if potentially, if uh, Father Christmas, as we know him, is not a continuation of Odin, it's quite possible that the Odin archetype, which was still you know remembered in some respect at that time of year went on to influence the, the, the creation of this uh, Father Christmas figure in later centuries. And I expect, suspect the same with Santa Claus in, 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 in Holland and elsewhere. 
Okay, well, if we mm. if we look back through history, I mean, how far back does Yule actually go? I mean, if we look, we can look at the the, the Saxon and the Norse he, Norse heathenry traditions, um, obviously. But does it, you know, does it go back further than that? Can we track it back further? Well, um, obviously, it's a midwinter celebration, and due, based on the, you know. The nature of Northern Europe, mm. it's a it's it's a very cold time. It's it's a difficult time. Food is perhaps scarce for a lot of this season. It's the furthest away from, you know, the the, the heady days of summer and the harvest and things. So it's it's a hard time also emotionally because I, here in Sweden it's getting dark right now about half past three in the afternoon, mm. and that's you know you're not getting as much sunlight. So you can imagine people are feeling a bit glum, and also there's a good chance. So the elderly are dying at this time of year and um yeah it's because it's, it's a, probably the approach of winter is, is something a sense of foreboding in among the community and you can imagine that it would be necessary for a community uh centered event uh and festival honoring um the the, you know, the power of winter and also uh, bringing everyone together at this time for some from jovial activities feasting and drinking i mean we can tell from from the alignment of stonehenge and uh, may so in um, orkney that they were lined up for the winter solstice so people in britain have been certainly celebrating the winter solstice in some way in some very important way because a lot of labor and a huge amount of labor went into building these um, monuments uh, and we're not quite sure exactly what they were for, but we know that they were aligned for the winter solstice. So that that uh, says that that demonstrates the antiquity of uh, of observance of the winter solstice in northern Europe. I can imagine that some variant forms of this uh, observance among northern Europeans uh, were, were common in all of the different peoples, and that uh, Yule is just one of the uh, medieval manifestations among the Germanic pagans. Of, of that same um, midwinter festival. Okay, well, if we go back to Roman times, if we look at Saturnalia, could we say that that's where Christmas met Yule? I mean, how, how relevant is Saturnalia and the, the, the Roman perspective and all that? Well, I guess uh, it's useful to use the term Yule to describe the the Northern European uh, introduction because Yule is the name of the Germanic pagan um, or y Yule in in Scandinavia and Yale in Anglo-Saxon England, but uh, that was in just in the Germanic areas in, in the north. So um, Christmas is first recorded. Um, I think uh, I uh, have the first reference to Christmas uh, on the twenty fifth of December uh, as a celebration of the birth of Christ is in the Roman Philokalian calendar of um, the year 354. So uh, that's before it starts to move up north. Um, but yes, in the, it's presumed that this uh, festival of Christmas was already mixed a great deal with Saturnalia, which had originally been celebrated on the 17th of December, but was moved to the 25th or in the late 1st century. And... Um, and uh, it was uh, celebrated long after the Christian conversion. I mean, uh, Emperor Constantine uh, converted in the year 312, and um, uh, Saturnalia is recorded as continuing into the uh, early 5th century. So, yeah, you can see this um, sort of thing would happen. I mean, we, we can also assume some, some evidence of the uh, of way it continued, because Saturnalia was like... Um, a quite uh, joyous, jovial uh, kind of celebration. It was kind of upside, turning the world upside down when masters would be slaves, the servants for the day and servants would be the master for the day and they'd be the lord of misrule. And uh, you can see some of these sorts of things are still popular in um, among neo-pagans and in some folk celebrations and things. But there's, um, to get an idea of what it might've been like, there's a, a quote from the poet Lucian of Samosata, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, who was alive in the second century. Um, and he uh, wrote about the god Kronos, which is the Greek uh, word for Saturn, uh, in his poem Saturnalia. Uh, it says, During my week, the Sirius is banned, no business allowed, drinking and being drunk, noise and games of dice, appointing of kings and feasting of slaves, singing naked, 
clapping, and occasional ducking of corked faces in icy water, such are the functions over which I preside. So it sounds mm. like a, a bit of a, a fun and games event, and I can see certainly that uh, from what, what we know, modern Christmas, and even from Christmas in the Middle Ages, I mean, uh, in the Christian Middle Ages in, across Europe, there's reports of, 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 you know, big feasts and drunkenness and uh, that kind of thing. So that could perhaps have come from Saturnalia, or maybe it came from Yule, but, uh, because that had some similarities as well, which was also based on drinking and feasting. Um, but there's also another Roman festival that's worth mentioning that may be a, a, an equal um, influence on the Christmas celebration, which is uh, the cult of um, an originally Syrian god, which, uh, Sol Invictus, the unconquered son, uh, which could be uh, something that influenced it because this became a monotheistic cult and uh, actually Emperor Constantine himself was raised in the cult of Sol Invictus so um, that's uh, and that was also in, according to the same Philokalian calendar was allegedly celebrated on the 25th of December so that uh, you know, already you've got potentially two different pagan celebrations influencing the, Christ- the, the celebrations of Christmas before it's even reached Northern Europe and the, and the, and the people who are celebrating Yule. Okay, well, one thing I've noticed uh, recently, uh, in more recent years, I mean, and I'm, I mean, I'm pagan, I'm not Christian, and I've been guilty of slagging matches with Christians online, and I've, I've, I've sort of criticised it myself in the past. But generally speaking, it's never really harmed me in the society I live in. It's been very peaceful, and um, I must say, I, I, there's just this presence of of attacking Christianity in any any opportunity at the moment, and uh, kind of sticking the boot in. And um, mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I don't really like to see it. it it's, do I? it's kind of it just doesn't seem doesn't seem necessary. But it seems like with Christmas as well, because of the the Yule aspect to to Christmas, it, it's almost used as an excuse to attack Chris, Christmas and say, "Oh, Christmas stole Yule," and that's all it is about. But at the end of the day, Yule has been and winter solstice. It's been used to apply lots of deities and faiths to it for that season of the year. So isn't it just a isn't it just a, a case of um, the birth of Christ being applied to that date? You know, it's, it's you know it's, it's it doesn't mean they've stolen anything. It's just it's just how it is. You know. Well, I would never say that Christians stole Christmas or, or anything like that. I think that's a that's a simplification and it's a bit of a, an immature way of looking at how things happened. Like for all we know, Yule and Saturnalia were themselves adaptations of much older customs I find, think that's quite likely um, as I said previously I think there's a necessity for a midwinter festival in northern Europe and um, I'm sure the, the early Christians recognized that and the Roman Christ, Christ, well, having Rome having converted to Christianity would recognize that these um, these uh, existing festivals of Sol and of Sol and Victor and Saturn had to be uh, um, accommodated, and perhaps the they merged with the one of Christmas, and likewise the same thing happened in um, the north. And in a way, we can thank um, Christianity for preserving this, because there are some elements of Christianity, you know, like the Puritans and things, and who rather like many centuries later the the communists of the Soviet Union tried to ban Christmas outright. And I, I think that that is offensive to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> That's, that I uh, I have no problem with the uh, the Christian preservation of ancient European um, uh, s- seasonal celebrations. It sounds very it's very nice, and I enjoy Christian I enjoy Christian uh, mass uh, during Christmas. I think it's very nice uh, hearing carols and things. The, the the story of the nativity is very lovely, and um, you know, I have no no problem with Christianity at all. But uh, yeah, anyone. I, I I have much more problem with anyone who would argue against Christmas. To be honest, personally. Mm. Well, yeah. I mean, there was. I, I heard a story the other day that there was um, uh, an, an advert for the, the the blockbuster Star Wars blockbuster coming up now in the cinema, and the the, the, the Christian movement wanted to put a, a Christian carol advert or something in before you know the, the, during the commercials leading up to the movie, and mm-hmm. apparently most of the, all the cinemas. I don't know if it was all of them, most of them, or all of them said no they were going to ban the commercial because it could yeah. be offensive 
And I kind of think, sure, that wouldn't have happened in the past. I mean, why, what's so different now than in the past that all of a mm. sudden it's offensive? And, and that's what kind of gets my nose up with it. Because as a pagan myself, I, I say, it's yield to me. I celebrate it. But at this, it's like what you say, Christmas has very much preserved it and made it a very special, it's it's improved you, if you know what I mean. It's it's mm. um, for me and stuff. But it's yeah, it's just, it's something I don't like to see. I mean, we we're living in a multicultural society now, big time. So let's be multicultural. You know, let's not let's not just think that's an excuse to attack Christianity and, and Christmas, which some people seem to want to do. You know, mm. Mm. Uh, I think I, I heard about the case in question. Uh, that was actually the the Church of England trying to uh, advertise with uh, with a prayer that it involved the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't a Christmas carol. Right, okay. it was just the Lord's Prayer. Which uh, I don't. Uh, funny times we live in when people are offended by hearing the Lord's Prayer mm. uh, in England. But um, that, yeah, uh, it, it's to do with advertising and something. I, I don't know um, what exactly advertising laws say about including prayers. I, I'm not sure if that's true or not. Right. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it is, it is all disappointing to see that. And you know, any Christians listening now, I've got no problem at all with Christmas or Christianity as a whole you know we're living in a day and age where religions should be able to get on fine next to one another and um yeah i don't see why things should change for for, for christianity in, in this country i don't i don't think it's i don't think atheists are being force-fed anything nowadays in, in today's day and age so so I, th I think we should just live and let live you know mm, i agree yeah it's um it's something that we we can see it, the, even in the, the medieval and Middle Ages times, before the Puritans tried to ban it outright as being unchristian, there was a concern uh, expressed in, in like that that poem I mentioned earlier, the, um, the Gawain and the Green Knight. Yeah. Uh, that it's sort of like a Christian morality tale, and there seems to be a, a concern expressed in it that the the court of King Arthur weren't were uh, as they were enjoying their Christmas feasting and they were coming together and they're eating and drinking, but they're not being quite Christian enough. They're not they're not um, the focus is not has moved away from the mass, and there was maybe a worry about that. Uh, and I think that that might be an indication that the there's been a battle among Christians to preserve um, while they've while they've attached. A Christian element of, of the nativity and the um, and the mass to uh, a festival, which is seems around Europe to be in, uh, concerned with feasting and drinking. Um, it, the, the feasting and drinking have been preserved, even at the um, at the request of the Christians. For example, as I said, King Harkon the Good, when he um, when he uh, made laws he, about uh, Yule, he made one law that Yule had to coincide with Christmas, specifically in Norway, and that the feasting and drinking customs were maintained, uh, and that everyone was to have ale for the celebration with a measure of grain, or they had to pay a fine, and they had to keep the holiday for as long as the ale lasted. I mean, that's a Christian sorting out this uh, this combination. But uh, even now, I mean, even, I mean that perhaps reached its culmination with the uh, Puritans who tried to ban it. But I think now there's a happy balance among Christians who are quite content for people to have these family-oriented or um, community-oriented event like aspect of Christmas with uh, with things that, you know, drinking and eat and feasting and things that aren't necessarily explicitly Christian but are just uh, so important to European culture and heritage. So uh, that's good, and uh, I think that balance is fine. And then if people who are not inclined to uh, towards Christianity don't want to participate in the uh, in the mass or, or the Christian elements, then that's fine. But uh, yeah. there's no, there's not, they're not compelled to in any way. So yeah, they haven't I mean, got much to complain about. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, if you look, if, I mean, if you look at Christmas now, I think it's the spirit. It's still got the spirit of Yule within it very much. So I mean. You know, with the winter solstice, with the sun, you know, the energies of the sun being its most di distant from us, uh, from where we are, and you know how how the celebration is. We've made it. We've made it. We've made mm. it through one cycle. Let's let's prepare for another cycle. You know, you're with your friends and family, and it's you're looking forward to the yeah. to when the sun returns because you, you, the energies from the sun it comes back to you because you need it. You know, mm. and um, that's very much in Christmas with the family mm. bond and so on. And um, you get a lot of people 
they come up with this, and, and it's quite true, a lot of people get depressed at that time of the year and they kind of blame Christmas for it. For me, mm. I think that just shows how powerful it is of that year because it's a very much a time for reflection where you reflect mm. on the past and the future. So, yeah, if, if you are a bit unhappy about stuff, you'll be very depressed at that time because it's a very reflective time. Just like if you're very positive and happy with the way your life going, it, your life's going, you'll, you'll feel very positive around that time of the year, do you know? Yeah, uh, it's definitely a, a time for uh, people come together. And I, I mean, I, I think that the, the one thing that perhaps can make especially useful when you're talking about the, the solar aspect and the seasonal aspect, like people who are feeling depressed at this time of year, often they can feel depressed all around the year. Many people, uh, you know, this is in a fractured society uh, can feel alienated. And the sense of alienation is sort of, um, I believe in part due to uh, a kind of distance from the from natural uh, existence to become so uh, far removed from a, a state of, uh, of of affairs, a way of living that is natural to our to, to our people that they can feel some they, they feel uh, uh, yeah isolated, uh, alienated, not in. Um, not in sync with nature, with the natural things. And one mm. thing that this is, that Christmas does is it reminds you of your temple space in the year, and in the literal sense, you know, and our re re revolving around the sun. Uh, it's another re revolution around the sun. You've gone round again. It's another winter. The cold is a, uh, a you know, a, a, a palpable, real sense of your position in space and time, and. Um, that's something you know that can snap you perhaps out of uh, complacency and the, the kind of this existential sort of alienation and and make you see uh, be a bit more human and see that you're you know where you are in the world you're a northern European or you're a European and it gets cold now and you know for centuries centuries upon centuries perhaps millennia your ancestors have been gathering with their community and their families at this time of year for the same reasons that you will. And that puts you into a whole, you know, into a tradition. It puts you into a, a line with something, um, you know, that gives you a sense of identity and uh, belonging. And uh, I think that's something that people should see as very positive. And it's, uh, it's you know, part of our um, intangible heritage. It's, uh, it's something very important to our to uh, to the, uh, the the to Europe and to 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 our uh, way of being our dasein as uh, as Heidegger would say. Mm, yeah, ab absolutely, I agree. I think it's and you kind of feel that as well in, in how you pass it down to your children. I mean, I, I haven't got any children. My sister's got um, two little girls, so I'm, I'm seeing them grow up into it. And you're introducing introducing it to them, and it's kind of it's just you you kind of see how it's carried on and i think sometimes i think nowadays people are very pessimistic with it bit bit because they're atheists and they don't find it very special well if you're atheist i mean if it's if it is just it's just winter solstice it's just you it's nothing to do then celebrate um, winter solstice celebrate the fact that the sun's returning you know it's kind of as a as a season it's got so much there to interpret um, I think it's as as you said it's such a sacred season i think people should um, make more of an effort to to embrace it and to pass it on down to their to their children as well because it's it's definitely as the years go by i mean i don't know if it's because i'm older now and obviously when you're a child it's a little bit more exciting and and and, and so on but it's just it does seem to be in certain ways it's it's becoming more just a, a, a capitalist kind of treat where it's you know it's the mid early november and the shops are already putting the christmas trees up and starting do it, offering special deals you know and um, that's that's a, that's a shame, but but yeah, I think it's important that people embrace a spiritual aspect of it, and you don't have to be a Christian to do that. You can just uh, um, embrace the the past, the the historic historical aspect of it, and the the ancient aspect of it. And obviously, if you're in Chris, if you're a Christian, then great, you know, then then do your thing. Yeah, yeah, it's got something for all all of us, really. Um, uh, it's it's a really important time of year, and I and and the early Christians recognised that, and uh, it remains important to Christians for them to remember the birth of Christ and um, uh, and the nativity story in general, and uh, uh, and for pagans for 
you know, this is one of perhaps the, the most uh, important celebration of the year. It may very well be that it was for the, the, the old pagans. It, that might be reflected in the fact that it was chosen to be the most uh, one of the most important celebrations for the Christians in the in of the year. They might have uh, deliberately done that. I mean, um, I I think so. Uh, it's it's something. And and, and atheists, I don't see why they should be uh, excluded from that if they don't believe in uh, anything. They should they can still believe in they believe at least in what's uh, material. And the earth is material. The sun is material. They do those things exist. And the and the um, their families and uh, communities are, have uh, a material, although the bonds might not be. Mm. Okay, well, I mean, if we look at um, modern paganism, um, you you see a lot of traditions that see uh, that that it's about the holly king and you know the old face with the green face through the with the holly bushes and so on. Have have we got like a clear idea of what I mean through the Norse Saxon traditions? What deity? would have been specifically worshipped during that time? Did they have a particular sun deity that was worshipped most? Uh, I don't know of any evidence of a sun deity being associated with Yule. Um, we got, uh, in Germanic um, times, we got a few sources to talk about about what they did around Yule. Um, the, that one I've mentioned already um, to, uh, in the saga of King Hagen the Good in he- yeah. Hemskringer, that has... Um, this guy, uh, this is a Christian king who um, he was fostered by uh, the Ang- an Anglo-Saxon uh, Christian king, and then when he goes back to Norway in the 10th century, he's trying to make the Norwegians uh, Christian as well. But uh, it's not having a very good time of it because they're resistant, and uh, he gets in a fight uh, one time, like well, not uh, nearly becomes a physical fight when he refuses to eat horse meat, which is somehow t- associated with a pagan. Uh, sacrifice at this feast mm. and the following yule um at the yule feast um he's confronted by these pagan people his pagan people who uh, again try to get him to eat horse meat which is some kind of pagan uh thing that they're forcing onto him and as a way to like um sort of probably an, an attack on his christianity which they'd seen as threatening to their beloved yule celebration somehow um at that same feast, the toasts they drink. The first one is uh, the first one is for Odin, and then uh, I think after that, the second one's for the king or something like that. So, Odin is based on that. Odin is is the primary deity associated with that. Mm. And uh, as I said, also in Gilfaginning, he's called Odin's other name is Yule Father. So I think that we can safely say that it, that Odin was associated with uh, probably the main deity of it. But there's other th- aspects like. At the, um, he makes a toast, um, King Harkon, uh, and uh, he makes a sign of the cross. And then the pagans get angry, saying, what is he doing making this cross sign? And he says, oh, I wasn't making the sign of the cross, I was making the sign of Thor's hammer. So uh, that means, well, obviously he was lying just to say that he didn't get in trouble for making the sign of the cross, but if this story is true and not just made up by the author, then it could indicate that that Thor was somehow in the, involved in this celebration too. Mm. Uh, but I say that when you look at um, the Anglo-Saxon evidence from this, I mean, this what this Hemskringla is written in the 13th century and refers to events in the 10th century. Um, it's an Icelandic author, but it's set in Norway, that, that particular story. Whereas uh, the Anglo-Saxons converted way back in the 7th century. And um, in the following century, in the 8th century, we have the Venerable Bede, the monk who wrote all about the English. Uh, uh, he wrote that they had a, um, a celebration called Modranit, which means the Night of the Mothers. Um, and it took place all night on Christmas Eve. Um, and it seems it's possibly similar to what we have uh, evidence of like here in, in Gamble Uppsala, the ancient uh, pagan temple here, there was something called Dissia Blot, which was a, a festival of sort of female uh, entities, uh, like uh, a bit like the Valkyrie or something like that. Um, but they might not necessarily have been gods, these, the, the, the things venerated by the Anglo-Saxons on uh, Modernit. But I suspect they could be ancestral or clan mothers, mothers of the race, of their, of, of their people. And um, that, would be, that would tie in quite well to having a, a Yule celebration, although presumably um, 
actually you all might have been celebrated a bit earlier than 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 Maldini, but on the twenty first maybe so it, it, perhaps if it was on the um on the actual winter solstice but um uh, anyway uh, you all um i mean odin is in the in his anglo saxon form woden is an ancestral deity and he was used to indicate uh, uh in the right of kingship his 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 um his blood legitimized the divine descent of kings so if you have that two modernite and um woden perhaps these are there was an ancestral element. I think that's what they have in common. And um, I've heard uh, lots of uh, modern pagans have uh, said to me that they strongly believe that uh, Yule is a time of honoring the ancestors, uh, a time of ancestral worship, which I think is plausible as Mm. well. Well, It's it's funny hearing hearing you say that because, I mean, you you know as well as I do, within the pagan community there's, there's certain movements where they hear that talk of ancestors and it's all oh, racism and horrible racists talking of ancestry ancestors and stuff where i mean for me recently i've been much really indulging into into the norse and sax and stuff and researching that that side of things and it's almost like you feel a tap on your shoulder or from your ancestors saying to you you know glad you're okay we've done everything so that you'd be doing what you're doing now and it's it's um, just a continuation of who they were and what they were. Um, you almost feel like this pressure, this, you know, don't mention it because it's offensive or people will think you're a bigot or something. And, and it, I think that's a shame. You know, I mean, what do you what do you think? What's your, what's your views on that? I wouldn't worry about what people like that think, to be honest. I think that's a, a silly thing yeah. to think. Like, is it, where do you draw the line? Like, is it? Is it wrong to prefer your own child to another person's child, or, or is it wrong to prefer your own grandfather to someone else's grandfather? It's absurd. It yeah. doesn't even bear. Uh, it doesn't even. It's not worth even uh, addressing. We, I don't think. That's right. I'm, well, it's like what you say. I mean, if um, if you the fact that you love that's a good example. The fact that you love your own child, um, it doesn't mean that you don't like other people's children. <laughs> children. Yeah. It, it just it's just you've got that kind of familiarity. You know, something that's linked. To your own mm. child, and it's kind of, um, but I, you know, I think that is very much in the. Well, it's, I think it was on last time you were on the show. We we, we discussed something similar, and mm. you mentioned, you know, well, it's 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 pretty much in the the Hindu religions. Uh, they've got a similar kind of thing, and uh, certainly mm. within Judaism, and um, a few of the others out there. Hinduism as well, yeah. yeah Japan. And it's like, why is it that the Norse side of it s- tends to get bullied because it, you know, it's kind of, oh, mm. don't you do that? And it's like, well. I want to. <laughs> That's a bit. Uh, I, I guess it's this kind of uh, thing in Europe, though, that, you know, looking at history, even not talking about paganism, even any kind of history, recent, even the recent centuries, anything except an extremely critical and, um, and detached view of any of the, the actions of your ancestors is considered hazardous. It could lead in uh, somehow, like, by magic, the, uh, not mag- you know, not I mean, as if by magic, like, any kind of like uh, romantic or like uh, or emotional attachment to the actions of one's ancestors, to the to one's ancestors or the culture they created, is is uh, going to lead uh, irreversible, ir- 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 inevitably uh, to some kind of catastrophic genocidal event that mm. can't be avoided. It's a, it's it's a total. There's no actual logical explanation for why people have made that assumption Mm -hmm. it is it's totally uh uh, absurd it's useful for some uh political uh uh, perspectives to 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 perpetuate that uh, absurd narrative but uh, it's it's nonsense okay well um what about i mean when i look at summer solstice um and winter solstice it seems to be i mean certainly in this modern day and age Winter solstice seems to be much more, you know, um, celebrated than the the summer solstice is. Is that the has, has that always been the case? And if so, why? I don't think it always has. Um, I mean, I know that uh, here in Sweden, the some uh, midsummer is still widely celebrated. I don't actually know um, that much about how midsummer was celebrated in England in the Middle Ages during Christian Middle Ages, but I. I know that you've got Shakespeare, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. So, uh, yeah, I suspect that was probably some kind of celebrations 
here uh, that were preserved, and then maybe only we've dropped off. They've sort of become less popular, perhaps in recent centuries. I'm not actually certain, but we do have, of course, May Day, which has been celebrated really a lot for a long time, and that's another thing the Puritans tried to ban. And the May Poll we have, of course, is um, very similar to the Midsummer Poll here in Sweden. Uh, and I think perhaps it might be that in, in England it happened that the beginning of summer, the first day of summer, May was more important than the middle of summer. Whereas uh, in Sweden, perhaps, and not in Scandinavia, the, the middle, the, the, the summer solstice was more important. Um, that perhaps, you know, just because of different uh, latitudes, they're going to have uh, different um, attitudes towards uh, the, the passing of the year. But um, in each case, you know, you're, you're wanting fer fertile soil, good crops, and, you know, women to get pregnant and have babies. Um, all these things uh, to, to ensure, you know, healthy, happy populace. Yeah. So, let, I mean, let's look at some of the, 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 the traditions and that of Christmas now. I mean, we've got, I mean, you've got things like the Christmas tree, mistletoe. Um, let, let's, I mean, let's look at the Christmas tree, for example. I mean, where, where did that come from? Where, has, has that always been around during, Chris, during Christmas and paganism or is it something um, that was introduced a bit later? Well, um, from my understanding, it's possibly, uh, I mean, what we, it's become popular and everyone knows about it because of um, early modern Germany and um, the royal family in Britain adopted it because we, they were German as well. So, uh, and then everyone in England copies what the Queen does and the, uh, so that's that kind of stuff. But, uh, and then American copied the British and et cetera. But it was, well, it, it, I'm not really sure how it got to Germany. There's one story that Martin Luther was the first to do it. Um, another, some people think it might have come over from Latvia or Estonia or something happened over there and there was a Christmas pine. But there is nothing in um, any Germanic pagan uh, tradition that mentions that pine trees were sacred. And I don't think pine trees are even native growing in Britain, so I, as far as I know. I think they're just uh, an, uh, an introduced species for timber. Um, so I don't uh, really see it as likely that it is connected to pagan uh, tradition personally. But on the other hand, it, it is a really pagan thing to do to decorate a tree. And I'm certain, I know for sure, we know that, that pet tree veneration occurred across Europe and that in, among Germanic pagans, it was very important. And um, I mean, we did, in, I mean, the yew tree was probably among the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons an, uh, an important tree. And that's an evergreen that is native to Britain. Um, but uh, the connection, I mean, we can we know about, we can follow the, 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 the rise of the Christmas tree. It's a much more recent thing. Uh, some people might want to dispute that and say that it is pagan, but uh, I'm, I, don't, uh, I don't think so, personally. Okay. Um, and what about, let's say, mistletoe? That's another traditional thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, well, if you are aware of the story of... Uh, in the Eddas of the death of Balder, he is um, killed by a mistletoe dart um, because uh, every single um, an uh, animal and plant in creation has been, you know, commanded never to hurt Balder. But uh, due to Loki's uh, mischief, it's mistletoe didn't, didn't get the message. So um, that ends up getting a dart. Everyone's the gods are throwing different things at. At Balder, who's invincible, but when uh, one uh, dart, a dart of mistletoe gets thrown at him, it kills him. So mistletoe may have had very, very strong uh, meaning to Germanic pagans as being the the, the god killing uh, plant. But then again, I don't actually know personally uh, when the mistletoe entered into Christmas traditions and why it would be associated with Yule. Um, of course, Balder is a god who, uh, you know, the dying and the dying of the sun, perhaps there's something like that, um, uh, some connection in that sense. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, that, that's plausible. Oh, someone did tell me, um, I had a chat yesterday with uh, some guy who told me that there's also a mention of mistletoe in a saga that in indicates its importance uh, to the to the Germanic pagans, I can't. I don't. I haven't read the saga in question, so I can't get any details of it. But certainly, mistletoe was an important plant in Norse paganism. Okay, and what about what about uh, holly? Um, uh, holly. I'm not actually aware of any specific historical references to holly as being important to pagan peoples in Europe. Uh, that doesn't 
this doesn't mean there aren't any, but uh, uh, but I, I think that it's quite obvious the Christian uh, s- the symbolic meaning of holly because it's the red is the blood, the red berry is the blood, and the crown of thorns that uh, Christ wore um, as on, uh, uh, at the crucifixion is the spikes of the leaves. And, um, of course, it, it's one of the, you walk around England in the winter in the forest, it's one of the striking plants. It's, it's green, it's, it's red, there's color when everything's dead. It, um, it can be quite, a, you know, an obvious choice to be used in reeves when, I mean, in, some, in, in different countries when pagan traditions, like in Europe, like I went for the, the, the Midsummer Festival this year at, uh, in, in Lithuania, which is Rasos, uh, and that's really like well preserved some of the pagan things and they go around gathering um types of plants that are at that midsummer are, are common so they, they're looking for they're using bracken uh, and they're also taking oaks um oak sprigs like young branches of oak um so i can imagine that holly would therefore have been used in a, a midwinter celebration because it was there uh, and it's pretty but uh, uh we'll have to we'll have to imagine how it might have been used Mm. Okay. Well, I mean, is is there anything else you'd like to mention to our, our listeners about what anything you might be up to in the coming weeks and in the new year? Um, uh, this well, I've been working on a lot of uh, uh, videos on burial mounds at the moment because I'm here in Upland. There's so many Vendel period burial mounds, which I find really interesting. Like there's the big ones at Gamla Uppsala and there's all kinds of smaller ones like Vendel and, and Velsiada. I've made two videos on that so far. I'm going to make another one and um, uh, maybe more. And I'm uh, looking at, uh, I've been doing a lot of research on the subject of boat burials and coming to some ideas about the religious meaning of them. And it's especially interesting to me because I've loved Anglo-Saxon history so much. And we you get so much of understanding of Anglo-Saxon history from one archaeological source, which is uh, Sutton Hoo. Uh, and there's, ever since that was found at the end of the Second World War, uh, it was, it's been, been compared to, to the find from Sweden in Uppland. And uh, there's some kind of cultural connection. It might not be a direct cultural connection because many of the things that we initially thought, well, archaeologists initially thought were evidence of direct connections have since been proven to, be, to have been common elsewhere in northern Europe uh, but it does show still that there was some kind of pan-Germanic culture and I suspect that this boat burial at Sutton Hoo and these boat burials in, in uh, the Vendel era, uh, area from the Vendel period um, these are perhaps the same kind of um, uh, religious custom because later times you have other kinds of um, boat cremations it's more common like people burning the boat with the body and the sacrificial animals, whereas these ones uh, are not from Anglo-Saxon England and uh, and um, Upland in Sweden. They're not uh, not burnt. So yeah, it's quite interesting, and I'll, I'll be I'll be doing some more videos on that. Uh, you should check out my channel if you haven't already uh, subscribed to it, and um, to look at some of my videos and history uh, about the history of the Anglo-Saxons and and the uh, pagan Norse mythology and paganism and things. So I try to keep people updated with at least one video a month if I can. And uh, that's about it for for now. I think. Cool. Yeah, I'm just just looking through your YouTube channel, Survive the Jive. So anyone out there wants to check out some of Tom's videos, go to Survive the Jive YouTube channel. There's lots up there and it looks really interesting, I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah. Also, you can, uh, as we mentioned on the last time I was on this, you can still watch my feature-length documentary on Anglo-Saxon paganism, which is called From Ruins to Ruins. Uh, that's a pay-per-view one. Uh, so for $4, I think that's about three quid or something. Yeah. Um, you can watch that, uh, rent it for three days. Um, uh, if you have any issues with renting it, just uh, send me a message and I'll help you out. Great. I'll, I'll link that on the on the page as well. Well, thank you very much for coming on again, Tom. It's been really interesting and uh, I really hope you have a good Yule out there and anyone out there, happy Christmas to anyone It's come in the, the, the coming weeks, whatever you're going to get up to. And um, it'll be great to have you, again, have you on again, Tom. Oh, thanks a lot for having me, Paul. I've enjoyed chatting with you and uh, good Yule as yeah. well to you and Happy New Year uh, to you and all your listeners. That was Tom.
Tom Rousel. I highly recommend you go and check out his YouTube video and also his documentary from Ruin from Ruins to Ruins. Always really interesting speaking with Tom. He's a wealth of knowledge with this stuff. Very passionate about what he does as well. Always on the on the on the mark, looking and researching, which is why uh, I enjoy having him on the show. I'm sure I'm sure he'll be on again. Email me any of your thoughts. It's always interesting to to hear what you think about the show and our guests, or if you've got any recommendations. Um, you know, it's two weeks away now. You obviously we've had a we had a bit of a horrible year, really. Obviously, with with a lot of conflict going on in the world at the moment. Not just around Europe and, and and the West, but also in other parts, it seems to be really exploding. Um, excuse the pun, but a uh, horrible pun. But it seems to be going that way at the moment. So let's hope as many people as possible manage to enjoy this Christmas and Yule, and get a bit of peace and and positivity, and hopefully direct that into the year year ahead into the new year. It's um, two weeks away now, and you know a lot of people are starting the season now and enjoying it. I hope you learnt something from today's show. Sorry, it was just me, uh, Shana, and David, both busy. But we've got we will have some goodies coming up into the the next couple of weeks and beyond into the new year. Uh, I'll have some more guests on board. Obviously, there's people away and uh, chilling out, so we're going to have to sort of juggle around and see what we can find. But don't you worry, we'll have something. Well, anyway, that's that's all we've got time for this week. So. Um, Thank you for listening. Keep linking the show and telling your friends about it. And most importantly, keep downloading the show. So until next time, take it easy. Bye.